Welcome to The Real Baltimore. I'm your host, Jessel Noor. The death of Heather Heyer at the hands of white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia, has thrust a nation into mourning. But the symbols at the heart of the conflict, Confederate statues, remain firmly in place throughout the country. In Baltimore, there are at least four, two of which the mayor has promised to remove. But to many, the statues are more than monuments to racism. They are symbols of entrenched inequality, especially in Baltimore, where the plight of low-income people is appalling. Here, unemployment, poverty, educational outcomes, and even life expectancy are far worse for African Americans. The victims of the historic murder rate in this city are disproportionately black. Meanwhile, the city continues to offer major tax breaks to mostly white developers and recently approved a law that would impose mandatory minimum sentences for gun possession. Standing in solidarity against mandatory minimums, against the failed policies of the past, against mass incarceration, against breaking up families and tearing up communities. We are here today against legislation that doesn't move us forward, but only takes us back. To discuss how all of these issues are related, I'm joined by a panel of experts who understand it in depth. Ryan Dorsey is a Baltimore City Council member. Ricardo Jones is a political organizer with 1199 SCIU. She headed the Fight for 15 movement here in Baltimore. Melissa Wells is with Choice, the, build, the Baltimore Building Trades. And Ben Smith is an editor at the Ideal City blog and podcast. Thank you all for joining me. Thanks for having us. Here. Thank you. So Ryan, let's start with you. Um, Under Armour CEO Kevin Plank announced he's leaving Donald Trump's uh, CEO committee. Uh, he's one of many CEOs to, to drop out of that. Um, you had some choice words for him earlier this year about his development, Port Covington, which, re which received something like half a billion dollars in tax breaks from the city. You said that plan upholds white supremacy in Baltimore. Are you satisfied by this move um, to, to, for him to withdraw himself from this Council of Advisors for the president? Uh, you know, is, is it pleasing? Sure. Uh, but like these uh, Confederate monuments around the city, the man himself and his personal dealings, his personal actions, are uh, really just the movements of symbols. They're the movements of kind of monuments to white supremacy. Um, and just as it is uh, a huge undertaking to do what you know, I aspire to do as a member of the city council is to dismantle the systems of white supremacy and structural racism. Um, you know, really what matters is the dealings of his company, <clears throat> not just Under Armour, but really we have to talk about Sagamore development and the whole de the dealings as a whole of Plank Industries. You know, people come, come back to me and, and say, um, you know, this guy hates Kevin Plank or whatever. You, you're always talking about Kevin Plank. That's not really true. I kind of said one thing once. Um, <laughs> but people portray it however they want. I could, you know, I could, I could say, you know, there's this real, you know, Walt Disney could be like mining blood diamonds out back of the parks. And I'd be like, we should have a serious talk about this. And the headline would probably be like, Dorsey hates fun and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Um, and that's what they would talk about for years after is Mickey Mouse. And, and for some background for some of our viewers that might not be familiar with Port Covington, it's this planned city within a city in South Baltimore that has the promise of, build, of bringing in jobs and businesses and uh, you know, spurring development. And for that reason, um, it, it got a massive tax break, a, a record tax break for this city. Um, it's been promised hundreds of millions of dollars in money from this city. Um, and it's also, um, you know, supporters say it has the best uh, community development plan, um, the, the best deal that an anyone's ever gotten in this city. What's so bad about that? Well, that, I mean, that's not even true, right? I mean, proportional to the size of the subsidy, the uh, community benefits agreement doesn't add up even uh, in comparison to the last uh, Tax, tax break benefits agreement that was done for, for Baltimore City. It's like a third of the size relative. Um, where, I mean, what are we talking about? 39 million on a 550, sorry, $660 million TIF plus another 400 some million in enterprise fund, uh, uh, enterprise zone 
breaks. So I mean, like this is this is massive. Thirty nine million is a pittance in comparison. And on top of that, Sagamore hasn't even said we're personally going to pony up for that amount. They're basically saying we'll come up with a third of it, and we think over the time of the the course of the development of the project, we'll be able to get others to do it. Then they're going to make enormous amounts of money just on the selling off of the parcels of this land to others to develop. Um, you know, if they can secure a basic level of financing, they're just going to start making money hand over fist from, from the jump. Melissa, you work with the building trades, the workers that are building these developments and other structures and working in these structures across the city. Is, it, is our, our model of development giving tax breaks to the wealthy, is it a failed policy or is it working exactly like it's intended to? Uh, the rich seem to be doing better than ever and the poor only seem to be living in, a, in more difficult cir circumstances and facing increasing re uh, number, you know, figures of inequality. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, well, we do know that it, it is predicated on a model that is not working. Um, that model does definitely weigh heavier in favor of developers. Um, we don't believe that development in and of itself is bad, but we know that oftentimes the benefits of development are for the owners. Um, and we really want to see development, especially in construction, where it's not, in other industries, where it's not, um, that profit margin is not based on, on um, repeating or on um, perpetuating poverty. So especially a huge concern is wage theft. And so we see that in construction, the service industry, also in home health care um, aid workers, that a lot of times there are, um, so there's recourse for getting your wages back. But unfortunately, the penalty to businesses that use that model repeatedly uh, is not great enough. And it's unfortunate. I think it's, it's important and it's good to see businesses take interest in development in the city in, in many ways around education, around safety. But I do think that we really have to have a, a very strong conversation around solutions um, that businesses can play a part when it comes to reducing poverty and directly through the jobs that they're bringing to the city. And also when the investments they're asking for, the tax breaks they're asking for, they predicate that on it's going to create economic development. And, engine, and you know spur economic development and we know in Maryland we see growth in some regards in terms of jobs but we don't actually see um, positive economic growth and a lot of that is because of a low wage work model um, job model that we have in the state and locally and in places like Port Covington they're talking about getting workers from outside of the city right there's there the number of actual local local people even working in construction mm -hmm. is pretty low yeah, in construction, there's a, I think the, the thing that I tend to notice is the inability to really connect training and jobs. Um, and also part of that model does the construction model. Unfortunately, there are a lot of players that use, um, that exploit workers and exploitation happens oftentimes in Baltimore, folks re returning citizens from incarceration. They're among a lot of the exploited workers where they're not paid their proper wages, they're not paid overtime. Um, and because of their fear of, of, of losing employment, they, they keep their mouths shut. And so there's tons of data nationally about the amount of wage theft taking place. But we know that the number is greater because a lot of folks don't report it. Um, undocumented workers, that the status, their, their legal status is used against them. And they're not able to or feel safe enough coming forward um, to talk about the wage theft. And um, a lot of opportunity does exist around um, unions to protect those workers. But there are still a lot of efforts to, um, to, to push down wages. And it has a tremendous negative impact on local communities because we know what the cost of living is in, the cost of living is in Baltimore. And if you have workers that are willing um, because they, you know, they need the money to work for a much lower wage than what the local area um, living is, then it, it creates a disincentive for folks to work. And I think, you know, when we think about safety, we think about, um, you know, the conversation around violence and poverty. Um, you have to even consider how working, working individuals are disincentive. There's a disincentive for them to work because they, they know that they can, they're going to work a hard, you know, a full eight hours, 10, 12 hours in some cases and still not be able to take care of their families. And we'll talk about transportation as well because just getting to work yeah. is a huge challenge in mm -hmm. the city if you're 
relying on public transportation. But you mentioned incarceration, and I wanted to turn to you, Ricara, because this the same the same city council meeting where there was a unanimous vote to take down Confederate statues, they also advanced a measure that would institute a new mandatory minimum for gun offenses in this city. So it seems like the city is taking one step forward and then one step back. Um, you, were, you were out there speaking against this, this proposal. I mean, the city is facing a record homicide rate. Right. Talk about why you're opposed to this new proposal for mandatory minimums. Yes, yeah, so I'll say I think we took one step forward and like 39,000 steps back. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's easy, um, you know, to tear down structures that are statues, but when we are talking about mandatory minimums, we're talking about failed policies of the past. And um, I think there's so much data and so much research that shows that this is a failed policy, that it affects communities of color, that it doesn't help it doesn't help folks at all, um, at least the mass incarceration. And I think just for the same people um, to have all of this data sitting in front of them and still to decide to support something like this, um, it just it just takes us leaps and bounds backwards and not forward at all. So um, I mean, I think it's a good thing that they are tearing down these structures, but we need to think about the real issues that we're facing in the city, and they're bigger than statues. And, uh, you know, Michelle Alexander famously compared mass incarceration. She called it the, the new Jim Crow because it's the same system where you're putting people in chains, essentially, that's existed for hundreds of years, and it really hasn't gone away, but it's taken a new form. Can you talk a little bit about, about that as no, well? No, absolutely. If you look at the numbers, um, Baltimore incarcerates a huge percentage of its population. And if that actually was keeping us safe, we would be the safest city in the country because we have so many of our um, population that's incarcerated right now. But what we find is that it leaves, um, it's breaking up homes. There are, you know, we're, there are no fathers, there are no mothers. And it also leads to, if you have a parent in jail, you're more likely to be incarcerated yourself. Um, so we have, whole communities and you look at the numbers that are you know the population is in incarcerated so it's affecting us very negatively um, when we think about ex-offenders when you come back and you have a record how are you going to be able to get a job to in order to support yourself and support your family so it just leaves big holes that um, I think that people who are looking at this legislation haven't even thought about and they want to rubber stamp it and say I did something but that it's clearly not it's not a it's not a solution and it doesn't involve the community at all Ben I want to turn to you um, uh, business leaders in Baltimore like to tout the economic growth and say there's been advances made over the last several years. In a recent blog post, you looked at um, the level of inequality and the rise in wages for white workers and for black workers over the last 17 years. Mm -hmm. What did you find and what does that tell us about the level of growing inequality in Baltimore today? So when business leaders tout those kind of statistics, they're right that there has been a wealth growth, that there has been some wage growth, there has been some home uh, property value growth. The problem with their analysis is that it focuses on an aggregate of the city as a whole. And so just like any other population, if you have a significant growth in the upper 1% or 2% or 3%, it's going to increase the level uh, for the entirety of that population if you spread it out. Uh, is if each person in that population is actually getting a benefit from it or having access to it uh, in some way. Uh, but the problem is you break it down in, in terms of the actual populations demographically that comprise the city, and you see the extent to which that wealth share hasn't uh, been shared uh, across racial lines and across existing class lines in the city. And you know, far from not being uh, far from just not being shared, it's actually uh, exacerbated existing inequalities, uh, so that they've become even more ingrained. You have even more disparities now than you had uh, a decade or two decades ago. So what we looked at is census data from 2000, and compared that to a study that the Baltimore Sun published recently, uh, early in 2017, and looked at the difference in household income. Uh, for black families uh, in 2000 versus today and for white families in 2000 versus today. Uh, so in 2000, you had about a $11,000 gap between the average uh, household income for black families and, and white families. Uh, today, you have about a $30,000 gap uh, between the average household income for white families and black families. And uh, what people like to, to do is they just take that statistic at face value and say, well, uh, you know, there's always been a big gap there, but they don't break down the extent to which that gap has changed. And when you break down the extent to which the gap has changed, uh, you see what was a 70.7% uh, 
uh, average household income of what the white households were making for black families in 2000 uh, has become just 53 percent uh, for black families of what white families are making in 2017. So uh, far from just being a, an inherited broken system, it's a system that we've made worse and uh, it's hard to get around culpability on, on the part of uh, policymakers for uh, that greater exacerbation that we see now. Ricardo, I want to turn to you because you helped champion this this bill that would that would, ha it would give Baltimore a $15 minimum wage. The city council, including uh, Councilman Dorsey, backed it. It passed. The mayor um, campaigned on 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 passing this and signing into law, but she vetoed it after intense lobbying by by the the business lobby here in the city. Um, we know that would have lifted some 80,000 wages of some 80,000 workers in this city. Um, it was a pretty stunning defeat, I think, for a lot of people. Um, how do you move forward now? Because we know that that would have been a, a definitive way to address this inequality. Um, what, what are the steps forward now? So I do want to thank Councilman Dorsey and the rest of the Baltimore City Council um, who, were, who were supportive um, of this, uh, of the legislation. Um, I think that we, in my opinion, 15 is not, it wasn't going to cure everything. It's not going to address all of the issues that I think Ben pointed out in his, um, his research. And do you think that's why there wasn't as much of a grassroots support as maybe it needed to, to, to really... Well, I mean, we had an overwhelming vote oh. in the city council. I don't think you get, you know, it doesn't get much But there weren't hundreds of people on the streets, no, right? Uh, yeah, no, of course, you know. Um, and I think that's, I mean, I think it has to do with a little bit of the, um, what we're dealing with in the city. Like, we have our members who are healthcare workers. They don't work one job. They work two jobs, sometimes three jobs. So, um, and that is just to pay normal bills and, you know, try to make it from Monday to Monday, right? So it is a little difficult sometimes to maybe come out to a rally when you're racing between picking your kids up from school and trying to get to your next job because you only make $10 an hour. Um, so I just think that, um, and I think that everything that uh, Ben pointed out in his research is it's very thoughtful and it shows a very problem that we have in the city, but if you open your eyes and look, you don't even have to read the research. Mm -hmm. So the mayor, when she first started, she said she took her staff on a tour around the city. Well, what were they looking at? <laughs> so I'm just, it, I mean, it, so I just think that that would have been a great step in the right direction to try to address some of the issues that we're facing today. I think in Ben's research, it showed that most of the violence is happening in uh, in certain neighborhoods. It's not right. happening in the White Owl. It's happening right. in the Black Butterfly, right? So 96% of that is happening in certain neighborhoods. So why wouldn't we try to address those issues by, you know, increasing uh, wealth for those neighborhoods? So I think mm -hmm. that... Um, it's just very telling for me why you would veto a piece of legislation like that. Um, and, and so now that that's now that that's sort of dead, at least for now, yeah, what so, what are the next steps going to be? So we're moving on to the state uh, statewide fight. Um, I chaired the effort, the ten ten effort. Um, it didn't get as far and as wide reaching as we wanted it to, to, but we're going to try it again for the fight for fifteen. We are. Um, going to introduce a get legislation again this in the upcoming session. Um, and we're also making it a election issue. There are a lot of folks who are running for election and, um, you know, we want to know where you stand on this. Do you support it? Are you not only going to say you support it, but are you going to work towards it? What are you going to do to actually, you know, make it come? And when the mayor did veto 15 on the city level, she said she would support it on a statewide level. Well, it would be great to see uh, what that support looks like. <laughs> um, and so the city seems to love giving tax breaks for developers, but an idea that more and more cities are putting forward is taxing the rich, um, taxing the wealthiest. In, in New York, there's a proposal that would increase um, uh, income tax on the wealthiest 30,000 New Yorkers. It would raise $700 million a year to fund repairs for the crumbling subway, to give subsidized fares for the lowest income um, New Yorkers, 800,000 of them. And some of the extra money might even get spent in fixing in, in investing in schools. Uh, we know Baltimore has a really high property tax rate, which is a regressive tax. Um, do you think this city should should put forward a, a wealth tax, a millionaire's tax? Can I talk about a slightly different idea for a second? Sure. Because um, I brought this up at the beginning of the budget process this year, at the end of the first, in the twelfth hour of the first day of our budget hearings. Um, I drew attention to the structure of the city's budget, which is an outcome-based budget. Um, we have these income disparities along racial lines 
uh, that, that Ben highlights. Um, we have this outcome-based budget that basically says we have these these things that we want to, you know, we want to put some money here, we want to put some money here, here, and here, and collectively they're going to make this, 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 and this happen. Um, and and we talk about all these different things that the community wants to see happen, um, and the the pushback is always, well, we don't have money for that. That you know, the the budget bureau lays out these priorities on behalf of the mayor, and then everything else is, we don't have money for that. What if one of those priorities were increasing black wealth? Uh, because that would serve the needs of the community, and it would address this, we don't have money for that. Um, if you look at income levels in the city, um, black families are, Black households are bringing in more than a billion dollars more annually than white households. So uh, black households are really the breadwinner in the city to begin with, yet the communities are left unresourced. If the black income level were the same as the white income level, in income tax alone, Baltimore City would bring in an additional $140 million annually. That's income tax alone. That doesn't account for all of the money that would then be circulating, uh, be available uh, throughout the city. The other policy area that I think we have a lot of room to make improvements is in transportation. You brought this up before. If we were able to invest in, and Baltimore City has the sixth worst commute time in the country, um, there is statistically, uh, the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance says that there is no greater disparity that we face as a city uh, as transportation. And this has uh, ramifications all along the spectrum of rising up out of poverty. If we were able to invest in transportation, moving us away from moving cars and into moving people, and we were able to affect mode shift, the decision for people to stop driving cars, um, if we were able to get all the multi-car households in Baltimore City to decide to have just one car in their household, this would free up an additional $800 million in disposable income in Baltimore City annually. Again, this would, this would be a boon for uh, our ability to circulate money in our local economy, grow jobs, grow businesses in neighborhoods, money that people are sinking into car notes, gas, parking, citations, insurance, and insurance in Baltimore City is astronomically higher. It's much higher than if you, if you were yeah. to own in the county. Yeah, in Baltimore, Baltimore City and Baltimore and PG County are the only two majority black jurisdictions in, in the state, and uh, we make up about 20% about of the population of the state of Maryland, but we pay more or less 80% of the car insurance premiums. Yeah. We could have our car, this is a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, and I think a, a great symbol of uh, transportation inequity, inequality, is the circulator, right? Because that's a free bus service. It runs pretty much on time, and it goes right through the white L. Um, <laughs> what about, expand? And you know, yeah. it goes from Johns Hopkins down to Federal Hill, down to Fells Point. Um, what about expanding something like that across the city? Absolutely, we should be expanding that. We should be expanding all, uh, all modes of transportation uh, opportunity um, beyond just cars. And I mean, and free sounds great to me. Um, I think that we have the money, we're just failing to invest it. It's going into the police department and every city agency that I talk to says, we would love to be able to do this, we would love to be able to do that. You talk to DOT, we would love to be able to expand the circulator. And they'll tell you flat out, we just don't have the money for it because it's going to the police department, the finance department. Um, the finance department knows that we have a greater debt capacity than we are utilizing as a city. Right now we're borrowing like 60 to $65 million annually, but Baltimore City actually has the debt capacity. We have very, we're very well rated as a borrower. Uh, we have the debt capacity to borrow between 80 and 85 million a year, but the finance department won't allow us to do that because they don't believe they can do it responsibly because our police overtime budget is so unchecked and so astronomical year after year. They just don't know whether they're gonna be able to service the debt once they take it on. 
And so the elephant in the room is the business lobby and their cl close ties with politicians, lobbying the mayor to veto the minimum wage, lobbying the mayor um, to not cut police overtime to fund safe streets and educational programs. I mean, the list goes on. Um, if, if the goal is to increase black wealth, there's going to be a huge fight with the business lobby because they are profiting on the suppressed wages in this city, mm -hmm. on the workers that have to work minimum wage, multiple jobs, um, you know, to scrape by. Um, they're, they're benefiting from that. They're, they're thriving off that. How do we, so that, is that the next fight then? Definitely. Um, I mean, really, I think getting at having a more equitable development model where businesses can bring their resources, where people bring their resources as, as human capital and labor. Um, I know for us, a big focus of the work that I've been doing is how do we increase the skin in the game that, that businesses bring, especially with regard to training? Um, I think that there was really interesting, um, and I, I didn't agree with this narrative around the five, five or 15, but the idea, the, com the conversation about low skill and I think that there, um, there needs to be, obviously people need livable wages, but there has to also be a push towards providing folks, um, individuals, families, households with the skilled training and connecting that to jobs. And so for the building trades and construction and even other industries, the apprenticeship model, the on-the-job training model is a key component of someone not just sitting in a classroom and getting a cert cert certification, which there is a history of folks getting um, certified and certified and certified in Baltimore and not having actual jobs on the end of it. It's kind of train and pray model, but really um, connecting folks to the on the job training, having having businesses, having contractors, employers that actually put money into training, even the shared piece around employees paying a small, you know, two, three cents per hour into the training fund. Um, it's being done. It's been done for hundreds of years or 100 plus years. Um, and it's possible, and I think that there's truly a need for that in um, the city of Baltimore. Um, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to follow up on that because the conversation so far has, uh, you know, centered around businesses, right? But uh, we've tried. I mean, businesses haven't stepped up. So what about a jobs program that is funded by the city, that's funded by taxpayers, something like out of the New Deal? Put people to work, give them a living wage. Um, you know, we've seen... we. We have some tens of, maybe tens of thousands of boarded up homes in this city. Mm -hmm. Put people to work. You know, there's the 2020 housing plan that's been put forward. The mayor said she'd approve that, but that's just something like $40 million a year. Why not invest some of that, some of that money that could go into re revitalizing this city, make it, some, make it a city where people want to live mm -hmm. and into those neighborhoods? I mean, I think that that is um, a lot, that, that type of model is something that we've seen in Detroit. We're seeing in Los Angeles and Oakland, be it a city funded model or be it this public private model. But I think the key to it is having a clear um, agreement around the standards, around um, the, the way that training is connected to directly to jobs, um, around the wages and benefits. It's possible. The resources are here, uh, both public and, and private resources, but there has to be a commitment to a robust workforce development model, and that's not where we are yet. I think it's possible. We're moving in that direction. There's a lot of folks interested in this that are, that are working on doing this, um, but, but we have to make sure that if we have something like that, that the, the New Deal worked because of the wages that was provided, that they connected it to the apprenticeship model. It wasn't just because they poured... Uh, money into building dams and, and, and um, highways and bridges. So it has to be livable wages, prevailing wage, especially in construction. Um, we've seen project labor agreements around the country be used in this way. In Los Angeles, they just did it with um, a huge investment with LA County around transportation, where a lot of folks came together to, um, to develop how training and career looks in construction and engineering and um, the bus operators and the maintenance of, of the transportation system as well. There, there was this phrase, there's this phrase that got used throughout the Fight for 15 campaign, and you hear it again and again and again in City Hall where somebody says, well, we all know, as if it's like a matter of fact, we all know that small businesses are the backbone of our economy. You know, like I come from a small business background, but 
which I, I thought that people were the backbone of our economy. I think that's where we should put it, be putting our emphasis in people, not how do we support business growth? How do we support people growth? Mm -hmm. And you know, to, to speak to your point about big businesses, uh, because that's who GBC actually represents as big businesses, that not the, mom the and greater, pop shops. Greater Baltimore. Right. right. Um, and this, this notion that small businesses are the backbone of our economy and we want to hold them up uh, for a talking point but then go to bat for something that's utterly um, ajar with what small businesses represent uh, because the vast majority of small businesses nationwide already pay over a $15 minimum wage. When we're looking at the employers that actually pay uh, below a living wage, uh, the vast majority of those are big businesses where uh, it, it truly is uh, just a matter of uh, those businesses uh, not wanting to pay out uh, a fair wealth share to the worker. It's not them not having access to that wealth share the way a mom and pop might simply not be able to make the books work. Uh, historically, when you look at the United States, you go back to the 1970s and you see this massive break start to happen uh, right after Richard Nixon came in office nationally where the uh, amount of uh, value created by industry in the United States continues to explode and value is simply the, the worth on the market of the goods created by a given industry, right? Uh, but the wage uh, stagnated relative to that disproportionate increase in the value of the goods created, uh, whereas you go back to basically the New Deal up into the 1970s, those increased in conjunction with one another because we had regular wage increases relative to that increase in the value of goods uh, produced. So I'm going to say something uh, fairly radical, I think, uh, in that those big businesses do need to be comfortable with taking less home because they've taken a disproportionately larger and larger share of the pie over the last several decades. And so it's not a matter of them uh, having to lay people off because they can't afford to pay those people more. It's a matter of them laying people off because they're not willing to cut back on what they're paying their CEOs or their upper level management uh, because they've decided that they deserve a disproportionate share relative to the worker. Whereas historically in the United States, there's been some kind of uh, synchronicity between those two. And you, you also looked at some of the data um, when, when that fight for 15 was happening, some of the claims the city was making um, that uh, you know they couldn't afford. Uh, going back to your point, they they couldn't afford raising raising the wage because they would it would cost it would cost the city some twenty million dollars to pay their workers more. Right. Obviously, it's a scandal that city employees aren't making fifteen dollars an hour in the city. Look, right. yeah. and the city is paying the city the the workers for the city, the municipal workforce who lives in the city, is making fifty percent less than the municipal workforce of Baltimore City who does not live, sorry, the, the municipal workforce in the counties or outside of Baltimore City is making 50% more than the workers who and actually there's, live there's in the city. And there's a lot of wor wor workers, especially police officers who don't live in the city. Almost 80% of our police force does not live in Baltimore City. And that report didn't look at any of the benefits of raising the wage at all. Right. So it didn't look at how we would increase income taxes. It didn't look at how we would increase graduation rates. It didn't look at how more people would be able to afford homes in the city. So um, that report was very problematic. And just to go back to um, talking about some of the businesses, and I'm going to name drop. So we have like John <laughs> Hopkins, one of the mm -hmm. biggest uh, hospitals in the country, not just in our state, but in the country, where you had people who were working there for 15 years that were not making $15. Mm -hmm. And then you have Amazon, you know, who brings all these great jobs to the city, but are they really great jobs? Are there benefits? Are there full-time hours? You know, what we, we want to bring jobs to the city, but we want to make, make sure they're quality jobs. We want to make sure that you can afford to take care of your family on these jobs and not just say that we're bringing these jobs to the city. Rakar makes a really good point with respect to these massive stakeholders like Hopkins uh, and the actual revenue that's coming into the city itself because Hopkins uh, doesn't pay property tax. Mm -hmm. We have a, a tremendous amount of uh, very large, very wealthy institutions in the city that are tax exempt uh, when it comes to the, the property that they actually uh, have value um, in. And uh, if you look at the amount of uh, property tax that Baltimore is missing out on, uh, because we have so many tremendous nonprofit institutions here, be they hospitals, large universities, uh, churches, so on, 
uh, relative to the surrounding counties, Baltimore is missing out on over 30 percent of its potential income taxes because those are tax exempt institutions, uh, whereas places like uh, Baltimore County or Anne Arundel County are only missing out on around 10 percent uh, on a given year of the, the property taxes that they could be making from those tax exempt institutions. So we already shift uh, a, a tremendous amount of the tax burden away from somebody who has the money to give, like a Hopkins, who can't just leave the city overnight, so we should quit pretending like they can, and who, by the way, it would be a massive morality scandal if they were to up and leave Baltimore over having to pay their share, so we need to quit pretending that we don't have that bludgeon in the city's arsenal of, of negotiation tools. Uh, but that's, uh, I believe, uh, a tremendous um, contributor to the inequity in, in the city's revenue relative to the people who are actually kicking into the revenue that don't have the money to give. Ryan, I wanted to end with you perhaps because you have, as, as a city council member, you have called out these institutions and you've been, you've been vilified and demonized by the press for doing it. <laughs> Come on, man, that's not but, that bad. <laughs> but, but, um, so my question is, um, you know, to, to really take on these, inst these in, in, entrenched interests, the FOP, Johns Hopkins, um, the, the, the businesses that are frankly, the people and the businesses that are frankly profiting off the violence and the poverty in this city, it's going to take a popular movement to really make those demands. What, it, what, do, you, what do you think is going to take to actually get that political capital behind these calls for a more fair and more just city? It is going to take the city council acting much more like a progressive legislative body saying, we're the rule makers here. We set the ground rules for people's participation in the economy and the social welfare of Baltimore City. Uh, a huge part of me just being motivated to run for city council, coming from a guy with a degree in music composition, uh, like a background in the arts, and having worked for a little over a decade in a family-owned business selling stereos and home theater systems and installing them in people's homes. Um, just to get up off the couch and go, oh, you know what, I could make a difference. It was because the bar was pretty low. <laughs> and part of that bar is understanding very simply the branches of government and going, yeah, everybody likes to blame the mayor about like everything under the sun, but they're just the executive branch. The legislative branch has the power to legislate. Let's start acting like a legislative body. I came in day one ready to, with a litany of legislative, legislative priorities, and I've spent the last seven months building a huge coalition of strange bedfellows to support one piece of legislation around transportation, a complete streets ordinance for the city. And we have partners everywhere from the AARP and the Maryland Building Industry Association signed on as signatory supporters to the legislation at the same time as the No Boundaries Coalition of Central West Baltimore, who is advocating for public safety and police accountability and food and health justice and accessibility, as well as white neighborhoods in the White L. Uh, all jumping on board to say we can transform this city through transportation and um, hopefully that level of coalition building around good, solid, supportable public policy is a coalition that we can carry into the next fight and the next fight after that. And I think that the city council acting as legislators and as community organizers is really what it's going to take. But it's got to be policy focused because programming um, either exists to fix damages that bad public policy uh, put, you know, created in the first place, um, or uh, you know, it's just kind of stop gaps, or it's something that like um, just can never go far enough. Public policy in Baltimore City is rooted in racism. It created the city that we have today, and the only thing that is going to dismantle our structural racism in Baltimore City is public policy that is directly aimed at dismantling the racism that public policy created in the first place at a systemic level. 
Seems like a great Absolutely, place to yeah. end this conversation. <laughs> I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, Ryan Dorsey, Baltimore City Council Member. Ricardo Jones from 1199 SCIU. Melissa Wells from Choice Building Trades. And Ben Smith, Ideal City podcast and blog. You should check it out. <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. The Real Baltimore.